is Long Way to the Top, and I'm your host, Shane Bryan. In the early 70s, the UK delivered a style of rock that included glitter, platform shoes, makeup, and outlandish clothing. It was glam rock. T Rex and Bowie embraced it, and before long, it was literally on the top of the pops. One band was at the forefront, originally known as Sweet Shop, the Sweet, and then just Sweet. Brian, Steve, Mick, and Andy, the classic lineup. Sadly, the passing of Brian, Steve, and Mick. Andy Scott is left holding the torch, and Sweet are headed down under for their farewell tour, playing their greatest hits. Andy Scott here to chat with us today. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Yeah. It's um, it's it's nice to be coming back. Uh, the last couple of times we've been in Oz, we've been doing the Rock the Boat um, trips, uh, the yes. cruises out into the Pacific, and um, they've been pretty good. Um, last one we did had um, uh, was actually one with Susie, Susie Quattro, but we also yeah. had the Angels and uh, uh, Russell Morris and uh, Brian Cadden. I People believe like they that. got up on stage with you. They all did. Yes, it was. Uh, it was magnificent. Um, it was a magnificent effort. In fact, yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a big Australian connection. I'll talk about that uh, very shortly. And uh, you've had a bit of a love affair with Australia over the years too. You've been here several times. But the first thing that I have to ask: the hair. I mean, oh my God, I'm having hair envy here because you've got. Still, the most incredible head of hair, uh, even after all of these years. Well, and it is real. It you is. Know, I was going to say, what's the secret? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. Uh, because there's a lot of people. Uh, when I when it, I went to, look, I, I, I'm 15 years with prostate cancer. Yeah. And as part, part of the recuperation, my wife and I went to California for about three months. Yeah. And I stopped putting the Paul McCartney version of um, stuff to, to make your hair still look like it, the colour it was in the 70s. <laughs> I stopped doing that. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, all of a sudden, a couple of months later, it's this colour, and my wife was quite envious. She said, that's the colour I've been looking for all my life, and and this is natural. And um, I, I can't probably look like a California beach bum. You know, well... It was just... Out, no, I, I, I'm I'm actually I'm I'm impressed uh, that it is the uh, the long golden locks uh, and uh, back then you know I guess it would have if you had have had that back then it would have even been more outrageous on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. true. But um, uh, the length's still the same, and um, uh, Brian had the blonde hair if you remember. Yes, but but his his was always cut to his cut kind of collar. Yeah. Also, um, it was me and Mick that used to have the longer hair, uh, and um, I, 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 oh, hello, Ted. <laughs> so my, my 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 dog's um, giving me um, giving me some information. <laughs> um, but um, we um, when I got my prostate diagnosis in uh, two thousand and nine, and had the um, uh, in two thousand and ten, I had um, all the treatment. Uh, and as I said, 2011, we, we went on this sabbatical for a few months. Um, we then, um, I never lost my hair. Yeah. One of my friends, when he first heard about it and he said, oh, you're having treatment. He said, I guess the first thing we're going to have to do is when you come out is we'll go and um, shop for some hats, you know. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, well, there, there's the dark sense of humor that the sweet have got, you know. Yeah. Um, and then, um, I didn't need it. And and then he went completely bald. Uh, don't mean, don't, don't wish to use those words, but um, you know he um, he, he lost all of his hair. Yes. And and um, and we're now um, 15, well, I'm 15 years down the road, and it's still here. Yeah. I, I was expecting some some kind of show of um, you know s something disappearing, but I'm obviously getting on quite well. Uh, I, I've not had to have chemo yet. Right. Uh, yeah. I'm on a very strong uh, hormone, um, which, which, well, there's been so much technology and so much um, uh, progress in, you know, uh, if you've got a problem, go and see, 
don't see the oncologist right now because there are so many things that, that, that can solve the problem very, very quickly. Yes. And here I am, 15 years later, still got me bumps okay. and still able to put a guitar around my shoulder and sometimes make it sound good, you know. I spoke to an oncologist friend of mine uh, and he said that the moment that you find out that you have it, you crack open a bottle of champagne because you've actually found it and we can now do something about it. Yeah. And I tell you, Australia as a, um, as a country uh, with its medical, um, you're at the forefront of a lot of things here. Yeah. Uh, one of my um, mates, uh, Jim Keyes, um, you know, from the yeah. Masters Apprentice, um, he's no longer with us, but he yeah. and I used to um, hook up and go off and get up to some stuff. But <laughs> he, um, uh, the last time, uh, one of the last times I was there actually on tour, uh, not not on the boat, which must be oh, eight years ago, maybe, um, we got in his convertible car and we had to drive down the, um, the Pacific coast. Yes. Uh, he couldn't eat much because he was feeling a little bit, you know, uh, he must have been in his he must have known something was coming so we had ice cream and we, we had a lovely day yeah and then i heard about a month later that he was no longer with us and i was very saddened by that sad loss uh, it is a really sad loss and and you know masters apprentices they were uh they were a great band i mean you did a lot of work with them touring around in, in the uk as well yeah no i um i i recall uh, i didn't produce it but i um I played on some of the re-records that he made you know, when he was as Jim Keys, not as the Masters. You know, when yeah. um, that must have been in the eighties, something like that. Yeah, you know, he came over, and I've known him since then. You know, yeah, yeah, incredible. Now, the, the, there is a big connection to Australia. One of the uh, big connections that we should mention, because that that was kind of the start of the whole career, was Mike Chapman, who yes. uh, was, you know. I guess you could say that the band was very much guided by uh, Nicky Chin and Mike Chapman. Uh, I guess I think they were called Chinny Chap uh, as a as a as a duo. Uh, but I guess uh, they were like the seventies version of Stock Aitken and Waterman. Uh, they were responsible for you, Susie Quattro, Racy, Smokey. Yeah. You can kind of see that sort of going through. Um, well, Mike was a Brisbaneian, but when yeah. we first met him in London. And remember, Sweet, they had not had any hits when they met Sweet. Yeah. And the, the the record producer, Phil Wayman, was the catalyst. He brought them and us together. So the first hit that they ever had was our Funny Funny, a yeah. song called Funny Funny. Um, now, I knew Mike because he'd been in England for a number of years. Uh, he had a band called Tangerine Dream, or no, Tangerine Peel. Tangerine Peel. And we... we and um, uh, I met him on a couple of TV shows with a band that I was in before Sweet. Yeah. And so when I when I saw him, I kind of went, "Oh, I kind of know you." And he and and then I, I realised that, and he sounded like a London, like a Cockney. He's very much where where he's living. He will adopt the uh, the position, you know, if you know what I mean. You I know, do he, have to he, say, he, I do have to say, Australians when when Australians are around. English, we start to get an English accent. I don't know what it is. It's a very strong yeah. accent. But but having said that, they were in that initial stages. Um, the band, remember, came from a different side of the business. We were a bit more um, rock, heavy, into Led Zeppelin and um, Deep Purple and Jimi Hendrix and the Yardbirds and mm. it, it, it so fronting the um, the singles, those early singles, didn't sit well. And Mike realised that. And uh, to give him his credit, he started to write things that turned the corner. And yeah. all of a sudden, you know, all the heavy guitars were behind the singles. And, you know, the, um, uh, all of a sudden you had um, Little Willie and um, uh, Wigwam Bam and Blockbuster and Hellraiser and Ballroom Blitz and... Um, uh, teenage Rampage, uh, the 16s. Mm. And then all of a sudden, it was getting a little bit, let's say, crowded, um, yeah. for want of a better word. Um, uh, cer certain um, 
certain um, uh, bands and artists were starting to get signed by Nicky and Mike uh, mm. away fr from it all. Mm. Uh, Susie was one of them. Um, yeah. uh, I remember thinking uh, when I first met her, you know, God, she's a little bit um, driven. And, and of course, the first single, you know, uh, that she had went to number one, Can the Can. Yeah. And then, then they got involved with Mud and, as you say, Racy. They were it's also in California. Yeah. They, they, they kind of moved to California, which left us feeling a little bit, well, what's going to happen here? Mm. And, and the record producer, Phil, decided, well, we need an album, so we might as well just do it. So we did an album, and we'd written a lot of the songs on there, yeah. which didn't really impress Mickey and Mike, because they, they came back. And this is when they wrote the 16s which I think is the best thing that they've, they've ever written for us. Right. That, right. that song. Right. Uh, but it had that California influence with it, you know? Yeah. And um, it wasn't the biggest of hits. The record company, uh, when we did, did the album, there was a version of Fox on the Run on that album, on the Desolation Boulevard album. And they said, this is a hit, but not the way it's been recorded. Right. So we snuck into a studio. Ian Gillen had just taken over a studio in London, where a lot of hits had been made in the past. Uh, so Ian Gillen now had his own studio, and we were the first band to go in there, and we recorded um, Fox on the Run, uh, which I produced, and the band we, we wrote, and it was the biggest hit that we'd had in a long, long time. Yeah, it was certainly the biggest hit in Australia, for sure. Yeah, and that's where the connection with Nicky and Mike kind of, moved away a little bit uh, i spoken to mike several times and he said well i have to tell you he said at the time when i heard it i didn't want to like it but he said i did because it was i could hear it was a smash yeah you know and i said, he, I, said I said i learned a lot let's, <laughs> let's put it that way you wrote that song that was that was one of the songs that you wrote where did the inspiration for fox on the run come from um well the lyrics were put together as like more of a band effort. I knew what the chorus was going to be. Mm. Um, but um, there had been, should we say, many a night where <laughs> Brian, for example, we said, um, oh, yeah, we, we saw you with somebody last night. Um, what was her <laughs> name? He said, oh, I don't know. You know, <laughs> and, and it all kind of went from there. You know, it's like, uh, it doesn't matter what your name is, you know, you know, we like each other, <laughs> you know, and, and it's... Um, uh, you wouldn't get away with that today with all the no. stuff that's going on, you know. No, absolutely not. Uh, see, I knew it had nothing to do with wildlife. Well, not the wildlife that we know anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's go. Let's just go back a step. Um, you guys were, I guess, one of the foremost uh, glitter bands that they were, glam rock bands that they were. But you wouldn't have been uh, to the extent that you were and I believe this is a quote that you said, uh, without the influence of Mark Bolan. Well, true. Uh, in 1971, we had released three records, singles in um, Germany, and they'd all been number, well, one had been number one. They'd been, you know, all, all in the top five. Mm. Mark Bolan had also done something similar, but he'd been around for a year longer than us. He won the award of the top artist, of yeah. the year and we were the best newcomers so we were at this award ceremony and we're standing on stage with him now we didn't think we were looking too bad you know like a, a leather jacket and a pair of jeans and a and a, a fairly flash t-shirt and stuff like that and he's there in all the finery with these sparkly jackets a little bit of sp sprinkle on his face uh, his hair even had sprinkles in it uh, now he wasn't very tall but he looked massive in that room because he was the one who everybody he had a persona yeah so afterwards we're in the bar in the hotel and we're chatting away and he's like he's got the same sense of humor he's taking the piss and and we're all kind of going come on we've got to ask you know do you get all your clothes made he said get a few things made but he said the majority of stuff he, and he gave us a shop two shops in the king's road and he also said if you want stuff, he said, there's a new store opened on uh, uh, Kensington High Street called Bieber. Go in there and buy yourself a starter kit 
of <laughs> makeup, the the glitter version. So we all went in there, and of course, we went overboard. <laughs> you know, it wasn't it, it wasn't trying to be effeminate. We were like, all of a sudden, Steve's got an eye that looks like um, uh, Clockwork Orange. Yes, you know, and um, but only one, you know, <laughs> and and the um, uh, and I was using blue make uh, blue eyes and blue lips, you know, yeah. and you know it it it, it just got out of hand, and the teardrops, you know, falling off off your off your eye, you know, it's um. As as Mick Tucker put it, and I think think this is this is the right way. Everybody else was trying to be androgynous, and we were just um, uh, being the ugly sisters in the <laughs> pantomime, you know. But and I mean, you know, I guess you could say it was um, a bit of shock value. But then uh, I think a yeah. year later, Kiss went and took it to the completely next level. Did you sort of think maybe we better out the ante? Well. Mike Chapman actually said when we were doing all of this in 73, he actually said, do you know something? He said, I think you could take this a stage further and become a bit more horror rock. Yeah. You know, and at the time, Nicky Chin wasn't having any of it. Um, and we were still having hit records. So we were a bit concerned about giving up, you know, things like Hellraiser and Ballroom and Blitz and, and maybe not disappearing, but going into a, an area where we were starting again yes. um but he could have been right it could have been great it, we could have been following in alice cooper's you know um steps and stuff like that yeah yeah exactly i, I mean but i think it was... it, but I, I honestly think it would have taken a, a different singer yeah to do that yeah you know? yeah and uh, there was an element uh in the music you know even with hellraiser that really could have lent itself to that very yeah. much so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, uh, we really enjoyed playing. And uh, when we were given the opportunity in 72 to, uh, to kind of come together and play uh, properly on the A-sides and instead of the, what happened in 71 where orchestras and uh, sessions were, were pulled together and we were allowed to play little bits on the top or uh, sing everything, um, I, I actually think that uh, the whole thing got better. You know, all of a sudden, it didn't sound like the late 60s anymore. It sounded like a new band, Yeah. you know. And and I think that, you know, f from that point of view, um, uh, that's when we all started to enjoy it, you mm. know, all of us, you know, the producer. <laughs> I, I didn't realise, though, um, it's not until you hear things later on uh, that the producer did not like Nicky Chin. Right. And Mike Chin. And Mike Chapman ended up hating Nicky Chin. Yeah, you know? I don't think they spoke for about twenty-five years. Oh, they, they, I think I think it went deeper than deeper than deep. You know, <laughs> you you came from the prog rock scene. I mean, how did yeah. you feel going to more of that pop rock sort of vibe? Did you? Struggle? Um, well, look, you whichever way you look at it. You can say, I'm, I'm in it because I want the music to be right, which was my part in Sweet. Mm. I have to admit, it was me who kept the, the music right on stage. And, you know, yeah. there has to be somebody who's kind of pushing that along. You know, um, you've got a bass player who is uh, a little bit lazy, but um, a great bass player and singer, but doesn't want to get involved with organising stuff. Mick would like to organise, but he doesn't know how to, arrange things in, in a musical sense he'll he'll say why don't i do a two-bar drum break there you know <laughs> that was that was his input yeah and brian who um basically just wanted to be a pop star yeah. so you, you, you've got all the elements there of um uh knowing that, that that you can turn the corner here and brian knew uh, Deep Purple really well. He used to share a flat with Roger Glover, the bass player, mm. and, and and I knew Ian Gillen from before when his band and I we used to play colleges together. Mm. So, looking at it from that point of view, Brian had somebody that he could not maybe look up to, but had somebody that he could relate to. Yeah. Um, so when we were looking to change from that pop thing into the glam rock thing, and then into slightly something more progressive, ending up with Love is like oxygen. Um, you you have to look at it all 
as as a as a progression, not not just in one one piece. And um, I think that we all had this thing in mind that we've been striving for so long. Here is an opportunity to put what we can do in front of an audience. Yeah. And you know something, um, the Germans got it straight away because we were yeah. going on stage and playing a little bit more heavy stuff and playing a couple of the singles at the end. You know, to, as like sometimes we'd start with the hit single and then do all this other stuff and then finish with, with another single that we'd had as a hit and then using that hit single that we've got at the moment as the encore. Yeah. You know, it would be a, but, but the, the basis of the set was, was not based around, you know, the sing along, you know, pop songs. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it, well, it's, it, it kind of seemed, seemed to work. I think the UK pigeonholed us a little bit. We're, we're forever seen as that moment on top of the pops where Steve's got a little black mustache and a, a German helmet, you know, yes. and, and the rest of us are mucking about, you know, um, and that, that's how legends done. were made, really. I mean, you know, that that's what people remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, uh, you know, you you mentioned uh, you mentioned love is like oxygen, and I was going to talk about this towards the end, but I've got to say, you know, yes, it was it was the end of of I guess the classic lineup that we remember, but in in some ways, it I feel it was the pinnacle of. And and it should have been a bigger hit than what it was. Yeah, it was a hit everywhere. Yeah, uh, it was a number one in some some places. Um, I think it broke the top ten in England. I don't uh, UK. Yeah. I don't know what it did in Australia. It must have broken the top ten. Uh, got maybe. to about got to about nine. I think it was in Australia. Yeah, yeah, similar in over here, and um, a lot of Europe had it in the top five. Germany number one. Yeah, because um, they got Sweden, it. Yeah. <laughs> Sweden might have been number one. Yeah, you know, uh, but um, uh, America top ten, I think eleven, maybe something like that. Um, and the album was dragged up the Billboard chart into the top fifty as well. Yeah, which, which, which was good, good news. But by that time, the band was starting to um, the original band was starting to get a bit threadbare at yeah. the seams you know there was um well i've realized steve did not want to be touring really um brian was a bit of a mess that's the only way of describing it uh we all wanted him to get back to what he what he could do but um when alcohol's involved it's like yeah. trying to what is it there's this old uh, saying of um it was as difficult as trying to get a drunk woman up the stairs and put her, put her to bed, you know, <laughs> and it was like that with, it was like that with Brian. Yeah. You know, getting him, oh, the, the number of times we, we were on stage and you could see by the second song, he, he wasn't sure where he was. <laughs> and, and we've had, we've had road managers come on stage and grab him and take him off and just say, sit down here, have a cup of coffee while we did a couple of songs without him. And then we're looking to the side and they're going like that. He's not coming back yeah. on, yeah. you know, and and yeah. it can't continue like that, you know. It, it just can't continue. It's got to, it's got to pull itself together at some point. Mm. And it wasn't until all the big record company executives and uh, it was Birmingham, Alabama. Um, it was a, a second to last show, uh, Birmingham, and then I think we were doing um, Atlanta, Georgia, and that was the end of the tour with Bob Seger. I think Bob Seeger, as management or their tour manager, had basically told our management that something was wrong and going on. And yeah. then I got the phone call to say, don't tell anybody, but we're all going to be there in Birmingham. And I said, well, I need to tell him. And he said, no, no, I, I want to see what's happening. Yeah. If you tell him, you know, and I went, well, that's that's being a bit sneaky and stuff. And he said, no, no, we just want to, as if we walked in off the street. So I had to keep my trap shut, which was not I wasn't happy about. But yeah. we um, they arrived and they saw probably the worst gig that we'd done in ages, where Brian walked on stage, didn't even know where he was. I thought he was going to fall off the front at one point, and he's still staggering about while we're trying to do the beginning of action. Yeah. And my manager 
was on the side of the stage. Nobody knew he was there, only me. And he rushed on stage and dragged him off. And we did the set without him. Mm -hmm. We had a shortened set because there were a couple of songs that we couldn't do without him. Um, and um, we came off and I could still hear the shouting in one of the dressing rooms, you know, from, from, from the stage, never mind coming off stage. Um, and I just got the hell out of there. We got in, a, me and Steve got in a, a car and went back to the hotel. Following morning, there was a big rumpus meeting at the, at the breakfast. Uh, Brian wasn't there. And they were kind of saying, something's got to change here. With, we were due to do some more dates with people like um, uh, Journey and Cheap Trick and people mm -hmm. like that. And they said, we're pulling all the dates out after, because they said, well, you're going to do Atlanta tomorrow, and yeah. that's it. Um, and somebody will keep an eye on him. He will do the gig. He's been given an ultimatum. And I went, well, it's our band. It's up to us to give him the ultimatum, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So anyway, we came off the road. We then went into um, uh, a place where we were used to rehearsing a, a small castle. It was called a castle down in uh, the Forest of Dean in the West Country, yeah. uh, towards South Wales. Um, took a mobile down there, started recording stuff for the next album. And we're not giving him difficult keys and stuff like that, but he's not able to. We tried to do some demoing so that the people could hear and it was just not good enough. So he was taken away and put in a um, um, a drying out place. Yeah. Total, you know. Yeah. And about a month later, we started again in London with the stuff we'd been recording down in the, you know, in this castle. And he came in and he, st he still wasn't able to, to get anywhere near what, what we were trying to do. Mm. And, um, uh, it was coming up towards Christmas, and I said, we can't make a bloody decision now. But there was a vote taken, and everybody, I said, it has to be unanimous. And everybody kind of said, well, unless it, unless something drastically changes, we've got to find somebody else. Mm -hmm. And there was this meeting, uh, wasn't wasn't pleasant. Mm -hmm. um, and Never then we went, into the, we went into the studio again in the new year, and I said, Ronnie Dio... Ronnie James Dio would like to come and give it a go with us. Wow. And Steve, um, Steve, the bass player, said, look, we've done it as just the three of us in the past. I think we should continue like this. He said, you and I will do lead vocals. And I wasn't very pleased about that because hmm. my next move would have been, well, I'm leaving then and joining up with Ronnie Dio. Yeah. But I didn't because I realized, because I talked this through with my manager and said, if I leave, he said, if you leave, the band disintegrates. Yeah. So I stayed and we did another album. And from then onwards, we never really had much success other than in places like Germany, Austria, Switzerland, you know, a little bit of Scandinavia. You know, it kind of felt, not fell apart, but we were still doing good gigs. Do you, not, regret, um, not, do you regret it? Not not what, getting rid of moving Brian on or, 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 or no, do you, you regret not joining not joining with Ronnie? Yeah. Well, you can't. You, I, I'm a believer that that you can't have regrets. If you have regrets, then you should have done it. Yeah. You know. You, you, so you move on and and, and you l let it go. Um, it's like when uh, uh, I was producing and um, uh, writing songs, and um, the band we, Mick and I were getting the band back together. Uh, to go on the road and come to Australia. I had a phone call from a guy in uh, um, Tom Schultz's research and development place who used to be Sammy Hager's um, yeah. tour manager. Uh, and this guy um, rang me up and he said, you don't fancy coming over and trying out for, for uh, Boston, do you? Wow. They, want somebody with a, they want somebody with a really, really high voice. Uh, this third album has been taking forever and um, uh, one of the guys has just been fired or moved on. And I thought, I don't want to give up what I'm doing now yeah. for Boston that isn't, I know it's not going to survive beyond this. Yes, I could go and do a, 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 finish the album with them and maybe do one tour, but I didn't, Yeah, you know, and I don't yeah. regret that either. And uh, 
very nice of uh, people like Tom Schultz. Every time they they developed something, they sent me uh, a copy of what, what you know, like a, a Rockman or a you know, all the, all their various things that they were developing for the studio. You know, just in case, just in case you went, oh, hang on, I could probably yeah. do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you're... we're coming to a point where yes. um, the next the next in line is working yes. for me. All right, I will. Uh, we'll we'll wrap this up. You've got uh, obviously you're, we're touring Australia, uh, and you've got a fantastic new lineup. Uh, I'll have all the dates. Uh, November, you're heading down under. Uh, you're doing yeah. all of the uh, the the states except for Tasmania. Sadly, yeah. Well, th th there was a, a moment when we could have gone to Tasmania. But because this, some of the gigs have sold out, we're going back to Melbourne uh, to the Crown uh, and doing another show there. And uh, somebody said that the um, the logistics just weren't weren't, weren't right to, to go to Tassie on this one. I well, mean, I love Tasmania. We can fly over yeah. and see you. Absolutely yeah. awesome, so Andy well, Scott. Thank you well, so the, much. The, the, the other thing is, we do have a new album, Full Circle, coming out. And, yes. and it, it probably will it will be available by the time we're touring. So, you know. Well, we are going to play uh Burning Like a Falling Star, which is your latest single. So oh, we'll give that we'll yeah. give that a play uh, very shortly. But uh yeah, okay. Andy, thank you for being so generous with your time. No problem. Thanks, Shane. Yes. Bye, mate. See ya. Thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Long Way to the Top. Hit plus or follow to subscribe to the podcast and head over to Facebook at The Long Way to the Top Podcast and give us a like. Keep on rocking and I'll catch you on the next episode of Long Way to the Top. Long Way to the Top.